Mega projects are incredibly complex endeavors that require careful organization, not to mention a lot of luck to get them right. Needless to say, even the best plans can go awry. With that in mind, with that in mind, click or search for this very large company in history that went wrong. Since the unification of the crowns between Scotland and England in 1603, there has been an increase in the unrest in Scotland. The country felt neglected by the king in England. Time and time again, he was drawn into English wars against his will and lost his only colony, Nova Scotia, in 1632. An act of 1651 exempted Scottish shipments from international trade by prohibiting the imputation of goods into England or its colonies unless they were transported on English ships. Let's take a look at the world's largest megaproject, Disaster. Disastrous Colonial Adventure in Panama The late 17th century was a strange era for European colonialism. The New World had been divided long before the struggle for Africa, it's centuries away. Expeditions abroad are fragile, prone to disease, logistical accidents and war. However, the colony can be forced to give away enormous wealth. A country in dire need of massive wealth? Scotland. The crowns of Scotland and England have been united in the person of James I for generations, but there is still no real political union. What lies in that sterile rock is chaos, petty civil wars, climate-related famines, declines in trade and industry, and Glencoe massacre. William Patterson, a Scotsman who was at the heart of the Bank of England, suggested that the Scots establish a trading post in Panama at this time. Trading posts will open up a new economic opportunities and allow easy movement of Scottish trade goods. The Darien Isthmus colony is the gateway between the Atlantic and the Pacific. The Scottish Company was formed on the 26th of June 1695. The Scottish Parliament passed the Act for the Trade in Africa and the Indies. Initially, a capital of £600,000 would be raised equally by Scotland and England. British capital immediately increased, but the East India Company saw this new venture as a threat to their interests. They persuaded the King and the British Parliament against the plan. Scotland was outraged and promised to raise the new capital target by £400,000 by itself, which it did. A remarkable achievement considering it represented about half of the capital available in Scotland at the time. Many organizations and individuals contributed money to the scheme, including East Lothian residents. Men like Andrew Fletcher of Salton and John Hay, 1st Marquess and 2nd Earl of Tweedale. Hay was released from the office of Chancellor in 1696 for supporting the program. Berg of Haddington also contributed to the program. This quote from the Haddington Berg Minutes of March 1696 indicates that the council unanimously condescends and agrees that this Berg shall grant to the Scottish company the trade of Africa and India. Haddington donated £400 to the scheme. That's a huge amount considering the city council isn't that rich. His grand plan was to prove a disaster. The first expedition reached Darien, or as it was known as New Caledonia, in November 1698. However, the king had advised the American colonies not to bother with resettlement. This, combined with the challenging environment that sent the group into a fever, led to its abandonment in 1699. The second expedition, a year later, was no longer successful. The failure made Scotland economically impoverished and caused discontent and unrest across the country. When riots broke out in Edinburgh, the city's executioners were accused of whipping the leaders. However, he was light with punishment and was accused of dereliction of duty. As punishment, the Edinburgh Council sent Haddington's executioner to flog him. The failure of the Darien program contributed to an already precarious economy. This became an important factor in the Union of Scotland and England in 1707. A taxing issue. Just like today, taxes were a driving factor for investors in Panama. The Scots were greatly affected by the heavy taxes William collected to pay for his wars on the continent, which most Scots disliked. They were also affected by the protectionist trade barriers established in Europe and the North American colonies, which made it difficult for Scottish goods to be sold abroad. Darien thus became an opportunity for Scotland to assert its independence from England, restore its national pride and enhance its position on the world stage. It had the potential to unite a politically and religiously divided empire around a single goal. It will also allow a starving and a declining country to establish itself as a global trading power. So in July 1698, a fleet of merchant ships with some 1,200 men and women and children sailed across the Atlantic to start a new life in Darien. But Patterson's vision and financial support from much of Scotland were not enough to ensure success. 
The venture was abandoned after just seven months when the second group of invaders arrived to discover the dire consequences of an epidemic of fever, food shortages and attacks by natives and foreign troops. Hundreds of people are said to have died within a year, including Patterson's wife and children. T.M. Devine wrote in his book Scotland's Empire that only three of the 13 company ships that stopped at Darien returned to Scotland. This disastrous failure of the plan put the Scottish economy in a precarious position and bankrupted many of those who had so readily put their faith in Patterson's vision. Scotland's seizure of the Spanish territory of Darien also violated international treaties and worsened England's relations with Scotland in direct conflict with British imperial ambitions in Europe. As Tony Claydon and A.M. Claydon relate in their book, William III, soon after hearing about the plan, the king declared that he had been not well served in Scotland. Blind ignorance. According to the map, Darien, near the panama colombia border, appears to be the best place to start a settlement. It was the narrowest part of the isthmus, so building a road to the Pacific Ocean meant less work. But none of the colony planners, including Patterson, had been there. A few separate reports from passing sailors were enough to prompt the planners to convince them that this was a paradise where wealth could be earned. The optimistic souls of the first fleet had no idea that the place they were headed to couldn't have been more inhospitable. So did the leaders, including Patterson and his wife and daughter who sailed with them. Scotland's climate is cool, wet and fickle. Darien's is hot year-round, with some locations receiving more than a hundred inches of rain each year. Scotland has an annoying cloud of mosquitoes, biting insects. Darien has billions of mosquitoes, many of which transmit deadly diseases. Finding Investors Patterson's Bill of Incorporation was presented to Parliament on 12 June 1695 and referred to the Commerce Committee. Meanwhile, public interest was disturbed by the release of a promotional strip entitled Proposed Plantation Care Fund. It states that people from all walks of life, even entire nations, yearn to own plantations in America but issued to arouse the longing it was meant to be protected. On 26 June, two weeks after its first presentation, the Scottish Company Establishment Act, Trade with Africa and India, was read in Parliament, passed and given the scepter in a usual manner. The law was extravagant in its concessions, permission to establish colonies in all unclaimed parts of the world, if the goods or persons of the company are confiscated or tampered with, the king agrees that the restitution must be made at the general expense, free trade for several years, freedom from all kinds of legal restrictions, and the promise of the King of England to help them enforce their treaties and privileges with other countries. Hangings In July 1704, Thomas Green, the 25-year-old captain of Worcester, an English merchant ship, arrived in Leith. Mackenzie believes that the ship is an East India Company ship that will be seized in retaliation for Annandale. He managed to gain legal authority, and Green, who was given command at the age of 21, saw his ship's cargo confiscated and its sails, guns and rudder removed over the next three months. Although many in Scotland were delighted, it soon became clear to the directors of the Darien Company that Mackenzie's accusations were not supported by any evidence and it appeared that the men would be acquitted. However, Mackenzie suddenly states that he has learned from the Worcester crew that Green drunkenly bragged about taking speedy return, killing Drummond and setting the ship on fire. Green and two members from his team, John Madden and James Simpson, were tried in Edinburgh. Mackenzie presented several witnesses, including members of Green's team. Their testimonies are contradictory and none of them can accurately describe the date, location or description of Worcester's alleged victim. The prosecution's argument, written in medieval Latin and Dorian law, was incomprehensible to neither the jury nor the accused. The defense attorney's objections were objected by court officials and they fled after the trial. Several jurors rejected the guilty verdict, but the men were found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. The Queen advised 30 members of her secret council in Edinburgh to pardon the men, but commoners called for the sentence to be carried out. 19 members of the council withdrew from the postponement debate because they feared the anger of the huge mob that had arrived in Edinburgh to demand that the sailors be killed. Despite having written statements from two members of the speedy return crew from London indicating that Green and his crew were not aware of or involved in the ship's fate, the remaining board members refused to pardon the men. Green, Madden and Simpson were mocked and humiliated by the crowd before being hanged. Green had full confidence that he would be released as an innocent man and was still looking for messengers on Edinburgh Road when the executioner covered his head. The rest of Green's crew are secretly pardoned and released.
Reactions to the failure The failure of the colonization project sparked widespread discontent throughout the Scottish lowlands, where nearly every family was affected. Some hold the British accountable, while others believe they can and should help in other endeavours and make the system work. The company asked the king to confirm his rights to the colony. However, he refused, saying that although he regretted that the company had suffered heavy casualties, Darien's return meant war with Spain. The continued futile debate on this issue helps to increase the bitterness even more. Around 15-40% of all effective capital in Scotland is invested in his project. Hoping to recover some of their capital through a more conventional venture, the company sent two ships from Clyde, Speedy Return and Continent to the coast of Guinea laden with merchandise. Marine Captain Robert Drummond is the captain of Speedy Return, his brother Thomas, who played a big role in Second Expedition and the ship's supercargo. However, instead of trying to sell gold as the company director intended, the Drummond brothers traded the goods for slaves which they sold in Madagascar. While drinking with the pirates, whose island is paradise, Drummond meets the pirate John Bowen, who offers him loot if they will lend their ship to ambush the outback Indians. Drummond backs out of the treaty, only to have Bowen seize the ships while Drummond is ashore. Bowen burned land off the coast of Malabar when he decided he was useless and then sank speedy return after transferring his crew to a merchant ship he took. The Drummonds decided to not return to Scotland, where they were responsible for the loss of their ships in their care and were never heard from again. The company sent another ship, but it was lost at sea. Unable to afford the cost of equipping another ship, the company hired Annandale from London to trade in the Spice Islands. However, the East India Company confiscated the vessel on the grounds of violating its charter. This caused an uproar in Scotland, aided in large part by the enticing rhetoric of the company secretary, Roderick Mackenzie, England's arch nemesis. Anger at the importance of the stale led to the scapegoating and hanging of three innocent British sailors. Before news of the colony's collapse, the second expedition of four ships had sailed from Rothesay Bay. Again, the number of colonists was 1,200 and in all about 160 members of the second group died en route. Although ships docked to supply Montserrat, they were denied water and food by the governor, acting on instructions from the British that the Darien colony was illegal. Consequences of Failure The failure of Darien's colonization project is cited as one of the reasons for the Act of Union 1707. According to this, Scotland's establishment believed that its best opportunity to become part of a great power was to share Britain's profits in international trade and the growth of British overseas holdings and therefore its future. It must become one with England. Subsequently, the Scottish aristocrats were nearly bankrupted by Darien's failure. Several Scottish royals petitioned Westminster to forgive Scotland's national debt and stabilise the currency. Although the first application was not granted, the second was granted and the Scottish shilling was awarded the fixed value of an English penny. Scottish private financial interests are also involved. The Scottish commissioners have invested heavily in the Darien project and believe they will be compensated for their losses. The Darien program was an unsuccessful attempt to gain wealth and influence in the late 1690s through the founding of New Caledonia, a colony of the Isthmus of Panama, supported largely by investors from the Kingdom of Scotland in the Darien Bay to create and operate a land route connecting the Pacific with the Atlantic. Supporters know that Balboa's first side of the Pacific Ocean was after crossing the Isthmus of Darien, where the Panama Canal is now located. The Spencer Collection consists of 91 volumes of books, pamphlets, pages, maps and several manuscripts. Many items are very rare. Thank you for staying until the end of this video. Share your thoughts in the comments below and see you soon. Soon. Soon.